he had been declared a criminal deviant under Indiana state law. After fleeing the hospital, he traveled to Newton, Illinois, and a few days later, on April 19, 1976, he abducted, raped, and murdered Kathy Jo Harris, age 12, by stabbing her. He left her body in a field. We are about to watch two parole hearings for the state of Illinois. The first hearing we're going to watch is going to be of this roach who, while serving time in a medical ward for sexually assaulting a child, he escaped to then commit this crime that he is now seeking parole for. After this hearing, we're going to see a complete contrast. We're going to see the first man in the history of DOC to get accepted to law school while serving a life sentence for a gang crime that he committed when he was just 16 years old. Special thank you to Griggs for pointing out these Illinois hearings and of course Richard for putting it all together. With that, let's jump in. And I'm back. I wanted to share that music intro with you because it's fascinating to me, at least, to see the different cultures and processes for each state and how they handle their parole hearings. Illinois has this interesting classical hold music. I'll spare you most of it, but I'll fill it in every once in a while. They also appear to be using a potato to do the recording, so please forgive me for that. But I do want to point out that in hearing number two, we will see the inmate in person with better camera angles. It's So each hearing is a little bit different. But with that, let's go. Would you like for me to start? That would be wonderful. All right. <laughs> we will. On March 6th of this year, Mr. Michael Lett was interviewed uh, by me at the Dixon Correctional Center via WebEx. The interview uh, lasted uh, one hour and 50 minutes. No one else was present for the interview. He is not represented by an attorney. Mr. Lett is a 69-year-old male who's been in Dixon Correctional Center since October the 9th of 2019. Official records show he's been in custody for 48 years. He was 21 at the time of the offense. During the interview, Mr. Lett was polite and he communicated clearly. The statement of facts is that Mr. Lett escaped from Norman Betty Memorial Hospital in Westville, Indiana, where he was confined for observation and treatment for two rapes and sexual deviant behavior. He had been declared a criminal sexual deviant under Indiana state law. After fleeing the hospital, he traveled to Newton, Illinois, and a few days later, on April 19, 1976, he abducted, raped, and murdered Kathy Jo Harris, age 12, by stabbing her. He left her body in a field. He drove to Florida in a stolen car and was arrested a few days later. Mr. Lett was convicted on July 16, 1976, and sentenced in Jasper County for the criminal offense of murder, concealing homicide, aggravated kidnapping, indecent liberties with a child, armed robbery, and theft. In describing the offense, he said he was tired and hungry so he stopped at a grocery store. He saw a young girl come out of the store. He explained that after the rape, he was taking her back to town. She grabbed a knife that was laying on the seat and it cut his hand when he took it from her. He then stabbed her. He said he was never violent like that before, referring to the stabbing. He said he did not plan to commit the crime. He said the stabbing occurred out of paranoia and frustration. Mr. Lett stated he was on drugs when the crime occurred. He said he did not know what he was taking as he got the capsules from the college student he picked up. He said he'd been taking drugs for four days and he was not sleeping. He believes PCP was mixed in with it and it messed him up. He does not say that drugs are the reason for the offenses, 
but says he believes they played a part in the way it ended. He said he chose to take the pills. He does not deny that the crimes occurred and states he takes responsibility for the crimes. In discussing the crimes, Mr. Lett said, I know it may sound cliche as you hear all the time that people say they're sorry. I would never have committed the crime of murder if the situation had not been what it was. I'm not trying to make it sound like it was not my fault because it was. I had a knife in my seat and Kathy grabbed it and in a reactionary thing, I stabbed her. I was high. I would give anything if I had not had that knife. I was driving back to town after the rape. She grabbed the knife. I freaked out. It was reactionary that my hand was cut with a knife. He explained he panicked, stabbing her twice while driving down the road. He then pulled her out of the car and left. He said that rapes happened when he was feeling picked on, ridiculed, or put down. He now recognizes that is the way he felt when he was a child and was abused by his uncle. His criminal history is an adult conviction history. Uh, of 1971, he was tried in a, as an adult in Indiana and convicted of the rape of a young girl. In 76, he was found guilty of uh, the charges that have been discussed in Jasper County, Illinois. His disciplinary record is that he's received 20 disciplinary reports since 1999, 13 major and seven minor. He points out it's been 10 years since he had a ticket, but then two were received in 2023 and both were classified as major tickets. In, on June 10th of 23, he received a disciplinary report for dangerous contraband, drugs, drug paraphernalia, and unauthorized property. For the June 23 incident, he received 28 days segregation along with two months C grade level uh, and a restriction from the commissary. He explained that the June 10, 23 ticket by saying the guard wrote a major ticket saying Lett was selling drugs to make money, while actually he told the guard he was sewing to make money and not selling to make money. He received 30 days segregation. His sewing needle was confiscated along with a razor blade he used to cut material. He said he bought the needle in commissary in 2016 when they used to sell them. Additionally, some controlled meds were smashed into powder and laying on his desk because the nurse, uh, the nurse smashed the pills so they could not be sold. On August the 2nd of 23, he received a disciplinary report for damage or misuse of property, drugs, and drug paraphernalia. An officer was shaking him down, and he had pieces of an ink pen that she said was a homemade pipe. He said it was not, and he was not smoking drugs. He thinks they believed him and thought it was petty as he received just 60 days C-grade level. An additional segregation in 2010 for altering a metal sharpened, point, sharpened object to a point. He said he used the end of the earpiece of glasses to clean his razor. He said it was not sharp. He said the committee reduced it to a minor ticket, but he was already in seg before he went to the committee. He explained that he was released out of segregation after the committee met. He acknowledged being in seg twice in 2004 for fighting and having a three and a half inch homemade screwdriver. He said what they found was a flimsy fingernail file. He said the fight was with a difficult cellmate who attacked him and he defended himself. He said there were no tickets after August of 23 and that was confirmed. He's classified as medium security, B grade and escape level none. His personal history is that his mother died when he was young and he and his sister lived with their grandmother while their father was in the military. When their father returned, he married and started another family. Both Mr. Lett and his sister were rejected by his father and stepmother and returned to live with their grandmother, ultimately being adopted by an aunt and uncle. 
He realizes that if he'd given his adopted father a chance, things could have been different. They became close only after he became incarcerated. He said he never understood why he chose his victims until he had therapy. He states he was abused as a young boy, starting when he was about four years old. An alcoholic uncle who lived in the home abused him mentally and sexually. He told him he was no good. He wished he was dead. The uncle blamed him for his mother's death as she died in childbirth. The uncle beat him and took advantage of him sexually. He says he's come to terms with the abuse he faced as a child and it has an impact on his thoughts and actions. He said that when things went wrong, he felt bad and took it out on young girls as his uncle had done to him. He said that if he had acknowledged and accepted the problem he had, then none of this would have happened. He said in the beginning he denied and took no responsibility, but he now acknowledges his acts and says he's learned conflict management skills, was, which he uses while incarcerated. He stated he's very sorry it happened. He wanted to write Kathy Jo Harris's mother to state his reg reg regret. His counselor stated it would be best not to send the letter as it might stir up old feelings and cause her some issues. He claims there was a letter to the Illinois Prisoner Review Board from her mother saying she no longer wished to pursue a denial of his parole. He said the letter was in 1993 or 1994, but the letter is no longer in his file. He said he inquired about it numerous times, but to his knowledge, no one contacted her to ask if she wrote the letter. He said the turning point in his life came at a picnic at Menard that his father, sister, and five children attended. It occurred in 1982 after a family tragedy when his brother-in-law, nephew, and two cousins all drowned. He said his sister's children were 12, 7, 5, 4, and 3. At the picnic, the seven-year-old immediately attached herself to him, followed him, and hugged him on his hand and on, hung onto his shirt. When it was time to leave, she wanted to stay with him and she cried. He said he broke down, realizing he was not able to help his sister and the children. He said it did something to him and what happened finally made him want to take responsibility and find out why the crimes happened. He said he thinks about the crimes and how they affected his family. His family continued to stand by him and he wonders why. Mr. Lett's last in-person or video visit was in 2008. He was in telephone contact with Darlene Lett in September of 2023. For programming, he attended a sex offender program at four of the facilities where he resided. He also attended drug programs. He had six weeks of treatment at Dixon. Dixon does not offer a sex offender program now, and it's been a couple of years since he attended counseling. His last work assignment was in 2021, he worked until his back became bad. His legs give out and so he walks with crutches. He can walk a short distance without them. As far as education, he's done pretty well in that he received a GED and certificates in drafting, electronics, food sanitation, and culinary arts class. He has a food sanitation license. He was trying to get a degree in drafting and was taking an English lit class from SIU, but those classes were canceled when Pell Grants were pulled from incarcerated persons. He says he should get parole. He said in the past he's denied what his responsibility. He said he did not understand why he chose the victims until therapy helped him understand. Now, stronger emotionally, he can take responsibility for his actions and he does not blame others if something goes wrong. He now has a positive outlook, is upbeat, and does not like to be around those who blame others and complain. He explained that he's not trying to make the crime, crimes sound less serious than they are, but he points out that it's been 48 years. He said the reason the board turned him down in the past is because of the seriousness of the offense. He acknowledges the seriousness of the offense, but sees people with double murders and execution-style murders do half the time he has done. He does not understand how long he must be incarcerated. He says he's gone through programs and done what he's supposed to do. He wonders if it's a political thing 
when the board does not release him. He has changed his thinking and thought process and does not know what else he needs to do. When asked why he will not commit another crime, he says he goes through a lot of disappointments and frustrations while incarcerated, but now does not respond. He understands his thoughts and knows what to do to avoid the frustrations. He said people think it's an attraction thing for young females, before, but for him, it was a reactionary response to other problems he had because of his uncle's abuse. He does not see it as a problem now. He knows how to ask for help, and he needs if he needs to talk to someone, he will. Also, he noted that he does not have a drug problem now. He acknowledged that it's been a couple of years since he's been in therapy. He tried to get into basic self-help and anger management classes, but they are not offered now at Dixon. As far as a parole plan, Mr. Lett does not have a well-developed parole plan. He states he would have to live in a halfway house and currently has no other place to go. All of his family, except for a few nieces and nephews, are deceased. The niece and nephew are drug addicts, and he has not heard from them in years. He asked his counselor for addresses of outpatient clinics in Peoria and Chicago, and wrote them asking what programs they provide so he can attend those if released. He said it's his understanding that he qualifies for SSI because he's been locked up for more than 20 years and that SSI will provide some income and health benefits. He said he's also aware of grants for persons who are longtime incarcerated. He would like to do landscaping, which he did while at Logan, but he's willing to do whatever job he can find. In favor of parole, Mr. Lett wrote a letter to the board explaining events in his life that affected him and thanking the board for their consideration. In opposition to parole, the Jasper County State's Attorney has consistently opposed his parole. Their most recent letter was in 2022. Through the years, many letters and signatures of protest have been received. There were more than 50,000 signatures opposing parole in 1987, more than 25,000 in 1988, 61,203 in 1992, and 1,447 in 1993. However, I'll note that no recent protests have been received. His en banc history is that this is the 21st time Mr. Lett has been before the Illinois Prisoner Review Board seeking relief. He last appeared before the Illinois Prisoner Review Board on March 30th, 2023. He received one favorable vote, which was in 2022. All other times he did not receive any votes in his favor. He most often received a three-year set. And unless there are questions, um, I would move to go to closed session when it's appropriate. Nicole, you want to come up and make a statement at this time? What? She's not testifying. She's making a request. Can, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. I'm Nicole Bartell with the Illinois uh, Attorney General's Office. If Mr. Let be paroled, the Attorney General's Office requests a 90-day stay for an evaluation under the Sexually Violent Persons Commitment Act. <coughs> Thank you. Motion has been made to go to executive second session. Do we have a second? Mr. Coates, second. Those in favor? Aye. Executive session. Do any board members have any questions for Ms. Tyson? Ms. Tyson. Mr. Bowling. I don't have a question, but just something I'd like to reiterate, having heard this in the past as well. Um, I note that as recently as 2022, he had zero recollection of what occurred on the holding offense. Uh, basically, I have no memory of it was, was the uh, running argument. 
Um, he now has quite a bit of clarity, apparently. Uh, but one thing I noted in what he has shared with you is these arguments that this clarity or this change of heart has come as a result of therapy. And yet he also admits that that therapy has not happened for years. And those two things cannot be one and the same, uh, at least in, in my opinion. Um, and I just wanted to kind of point that out as I listened to what he was sharing with you in the interview. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Seeing none, Ms. Tyson, do you want to have a recommendation? Uh, yes. My recommendation is to deny parole. Mr. Lett has been a sexually violent person and a danger to the community. There's a substantial risk that he will not conform to reasonable conditions of parole. My concern is that his behavior cannot be accurately predicted when he's in an unstructured environment and around young women. I believe his release would deprecate the seriousness of his offense, and I also note he lacks a viable release plan and does not have a release site. Second. I'll second. All right, motion been made and seconded. Uh, Allie, call the roll. Ms. Tyson? Yes. Mr. Boland? Yes. Mr. Coates? Yes. Mr. Delgado? Yes. Ms. Gleboker? Yes. Ms. Golf? Yes. Mr. Grubbs? Yes. Mr. Heaton? Yes. Ms. Schaffner? Yes. Ms. Taronis? Yes. Mr. Toothy? Yes. 11 to 0. Well, there you have it a unanimous denial of 11. It's interesting to think that one actually had granted in the last parole hearing. It's hard to imagine how that could be possible. Now, remember, we are about to watch another parole hearing right after this. The man who actually got accepted to law school. And keep in mind that he is going to need a minimum of eight to vote in favor for him to get approved. If it's just seven, he'll actually get denied. So let's unpack this first. We have a lot of information, uh, thanks to Richard. Um, so we're going to go through the details and we have his court appeal, but we also have his actual um, review by the parole board for his 2016 hearing, which has a ton of information. So we're going to focus on that. But before we do, I just want to point out a few things. One is that if you want to see anything that's broken in the system besides their filming equipment and, I don't know, elevator hold music. It's the idea that of how many times he has been up for parole. And not just how many times he's been up for parole, but how many, how recent his parole, first initial parole eligibility even took place. In 1987, he had his first parole hearing that would have been just 10 years after his conviction for sexually assaulting and killing a child. The mother of the victim in 87 had to show up to parole. In 88 had to show up to parole. In 92 and then 93. And then at some point, maybe she passed away. I don't know. But they... <laughs> They had 50,000 petitions in 87 saying that he shouldn't get released. 25,000 petitions in 88. These numbers are astronomical. I mean, this is before the internet. These are people that are filling out by hand, going around the neighborhood. This crime shook a community. 50,000. I mean, that, that number is hard to digest for me. And then in 1992, they smashed that record by getting 61,000 petitions. And now in 93, just a year later, it dropped all the way to 1,500. And I, I'm just saying that I think that's criminal and shocking. And we, you know how we vent about this. But the idea that they would victimize and re-victimize and that their law allows 
him to come up for parole year after year and put the family through this is to me just insane. Put the community through it. He's been up for parole 21 times. And even now in this denial, they're allowing him to come up for parole in three more years. And it's like, I don't know, what's the purpose of that? You know, is it just to give him hope? Is it, he's, he's, there are certain people that are broken and he's one of them. And you'll even read it in the reports, what they come up with, but you can hear it just, even what he said, I, <laughs> I'm sorry that it happened. I wish that the knife wasn't there. He's blaming it on the knife being there. She picked it up and I panicked. He's still lying. He's still in denial. He's still not taking accountability. I only lash like the words that he said at this parole hearing only shows just, you know, um, but they all did deny at least they did that and and it was interesting because it's just this is not what i picture when i think illinois that big room and the kind of all i don't know it's just not what i pictured and you might be surprised by the next hearing too but let's jump in and, and if if you want to just skip over my unpacking i'm not going to take it personally scroll ahead and jump to the next hearing so let's go because this might take 15 minutes or so. So remember, this is the report for his 2016 parole hearing. And again, thank you, Griggs, for telling us that this existed, the secret sauce, our local native Illinois man, Mr. Griggs. Um, And, and, and I know I say thank you this a lot, but I was traveling when this hearing happened and Richard recorded it, figured out how to use the uh, software post-surgery, went ahead and made sure we got this for us. So, of course, that's huge. All right. So, Mr. Harris shared with the board and the inmate that Lett was convicted of an aggravated kidnapping, murder, and indecent liberties with a child. This roach, who then somehow got parole 10 years later, and mind you, was just arrested five years previously. <sighs> the victim, who was Kathy Jo Harris, 12 years of age, before the committed offense of Kathy Jo Harris took place, the inmate let was already been declared by the Indiana state law to be a criminal sexual deviant. He escaped from Mr. Norman Berry Memorial Hospital in Westville, Indiana, six days prior to the aforementioned offense. It, and that just makes it all that more tragic. This could have totally been prevented in so many ways. At the time of the arrest, Michael Lett was identified as a white male, 21 years of age, medium complexion with blue eyes, light brown hair, standing at six foot two, 210 pounds. This you know, monster doing this to 12 year old girl. On July 12, 1976, the defendant Michael Latt enters a plea of not guilty. The jury finds the defendant guilty of murder, aggravated kidnapping, and indecent liberties of the child, armed robbery, theft, concealment of homicidal death. At the time of the offense, Scott L. Belford, assistant public defender of Newton IL, represented the defendant. The defendant, Michael Lett, made the following comments regarding the present offense. I just don't understand how he's eligible for parole after 10 years. Like, that is crazy. He stated that he was about to complete phase five of the program of Mr. Norman Beatty Hospital, had community employment, a sponsor for parole purposes, and would have been paroled upon completion of the program. However, a female patient at the Norman Beatty Hospital got a case of the crabs and accused the defendant and another patient of his unit ward of having intercourse with her and passing on the crabs. Like, as if the story had to get any more convoluted and, and, and sick, this is how it is. He's at the hospital for some reason, and he's accused of giving someone else crabs there while he's, like, incarcerated for his previous offense. This is before he escapes. The defendant states that he... Can you guys see this properly? Let's see if I can make it better for you. It's a little better, right? Here we go. The defendant states that he and other fellows 
were both tested and came out clean, but the blame was placed on him and he was taken out of the program and placed in a holding pattern and confined to maximum security. Of course, was, of course, he was innocent. We know that. The defendant stated that personnel didn't like him and that he couldn't have had intercourse with the female because he was granted weekend passes and was on a weekend pass at the time of that alleged incident. Can you imagine he was that's the way that they guarded this guy who had done this to a child. They gave him weekend passes. On April 13, 1976, the defendant left the facility after dinner by telling the security that he wanted to go to the kitchen and get a loaf of bread for his ward. It's hardly, they, it's not escape. You know, they make it sound like he escaped. He like just walked out. He went to the kitchen and walked out the door through a tunnel and hid in the personnel lounge until it was safe to leave the grounds. The defendant stated that he contacted his parents and girlfriend, and they in turn were going to let to get him legal advice for him, and he planned to turn himself in. On the contrary, he met with two fellows in the parking lot, didn't know them. They found a car with keys locked inside, so they broke into the car and took it. The defendant stated the fellows were with him for one day and they sold him some speed and mass and uh what's it called masculine and was also drinking and everything from there became a blur poor guy the defendant states that he remembers and he talks about being bullied he's six foot two 210 pounds and in his thing i did it because i was bullied yeah okay okay bro um the defendant states that he remembers waking up in the hospital parking lot uh, at around 10 a.m. He remembers buying some crickets at a bait shop and going fishing between only and Newton, Illinois. He stated he drank some beer and took a couple of pills and that it rained off and on that day. He also recalls picking up a hitchhiker named Mike and asked where he was going anywhere special, so they headed to Florida. The defendant stated that he was arrested in Florida and kept in a small room for approximately six days and nearly cracked up in that little place. The defendant state recalls nothing of these present offenses. Inmate defendant let stated that he was shown the victim's picture. He did not recognize her as someone he had seen before. According to the examiner review, Mr. Letter appears unable to adequately control his sexual desires. And as of this day, has not gained insight into sexual deviancy. Remember, this is 2016 parole hearing review. He began having sex um, with 10 to 12 year olds when he himself was approximately 12 years of age and appears to be fixated at that particular stage of attraction. It is the examiner's opinion that Mr. Lett is a, is a pedophiliac and in need of mental treatment for his disorder. <clears throat> I gotta say this uh this interview is imp I like how they document this in Illinois and I like that they uh called him that didn't give him a low risk score didn't say well oh yeah you got some programs now you're 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 healed at the age of 14 he propositioned a girl and was given probation at the age of 14 so here's when he starts <laughs> at the age of 14 he was given a uh, probation and then at the age of 14, he broke into a department store and was given probation again. At the age of 15 and 16, he was picked up for curfew, expelled from school twice, once for fighting and once for breaking into a locker. He was charged and convicted of sexual assault and sentenced to Indiana State uh, Reformatory. He had a second degree charge of sexual assault and was committed to the state hospital for treatment under CSD Act. Are these two separate assaults or... Yeah, a second charge. So this was his second charge. So he go. I guess he goes to prison. I think he got a five-year sentence. Then he gets out immediately, does it again, and for some reason they send him to a hospital. That's um, that's brilliant of them. Just completely brilliant. Uh, inmate Let was adjust was adjusted a delinquent child in case number J six nine six one D in Davis County. Juvenile Court, Washington, Indiana. At the juvenile house, he was very destructive and damaged property to boats, the conversation club, breaking and entering, where he was uh, apprehended partially dressed in female clothing and enticing female children for sexual purposes at Cis Clothing Store in Washington, Indiana. 
On June 11, 1969, the juvenile court of Davies County, um, a judge inmate let to be a delinquent child and entered a temporary order of probation to parents with certain conditions, shall not hang out in uh, Rome the street, shall not have contact with female children, shall abide by a 10.30 p.m. curfew. Why even such a late curfew? He's a child. <laughs> Gosh, I mean, there are some things that are just bizarre. I mean, even in, in Louisiana, they got a curfew till like it starts at 9 p.m. for adults. They're giving a child a 10.30 p.m. curfew. Wow, that's real strict, man. Inmate Lett was admitted to Ellensville Hospital for evaluation approximately one week during 1969 and again from October 9th, 1971, December 1st, 1971, September 1971, the circuit court uh, appointed two doctors who hold unlimited license to practice medicine and da, 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 da. Then they say now he's currently working as a janitor. They go through his different tickets. Um, this is interesting because this is different. Uh, than it is now. But at this time, if he was to be paroled, he would live with his ex-wife. So somehow this guy got married. He told the board uh, on a letter on behalf of March 12, 2007 from his ex-wife, Darlene, letter states, I'm writing concerning my husband. I'm requesting that if he's granted parole, that he be paroled to his parents' home. I'm filing for divorce, so I don't think it would be a good idea for Mike to be around here. <laughs> oh, that's great. So she married him in the second. I don't know. Like uh, she's like, no, 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 no. Stay with his parent. He's not having that good. Okay. At least she's not totally crazy. I mean, she's she's crazy, but she's not totally crazy. There's something with the women that that go after these men and these nut jobs. But I guess as soon as like it was a chance for parole, he, she changed her mind. I don't know. The inmate said, "I am disappointed with my wife. I've caused so much pain and suffering on what I've taken from them. The victim, Kathy." Her family and my family. I have caused a lot of humiliation, pain, and suffering. It's frustrating and devastating. I can't change it. If I go back 45 years, my life would be different. None of this would ever have happened. I understand now why it happened. I do not have questionable feelings of doubt about myself. I wish there was something I could do to make it better. I've asked for forgiveness. And oh, right, let's not forget that he clearly faked a letter from the victim's mother, who is the victim also, of course. And claims that, oh, I don't know where the letter went, but she said she wrote a letter that I should be free. Um, I'm a changed person. I take full responsibility for my actions. I become a better person. I want the opportunity to prove that. Well, no, you're not going to get the opportunity, Roach. It's, uh, I'll put this link in the description. And again, thank you, Richard. Let me just go check out the, uh, so we'll run through this before we go to the next hearing. Um, now it's, it's, it's his appeal. So on, it, it goes into more of the details of the crime. So on April 19, 1976, uh, 12 year old Kathy Jo Harris was was murdered. The trial of the defendant's state introduced evidence um, on April 15, 1976. A brown 1972 Dodge Dart uh, bearing a yellow New Jersey license plate was stolen from the parking lot. Subsequently, on April 22, 1976, the Florida Deputy Sheriff Larry Graham observed the Dart in Naples, Florida. Following a computer check at the license plate, they had computers? Really? Um, I didn't realize like they were using computer. I guess that dates me. I just, you know, I don't mean what I, I guess he would radio it in home. Oh, okay. Um, he issued a radio broadcast to be on the lookout for the car. Later that day, Naples police uh, officer Will and Good saw the automobile and arrested the defendant who was driving it. Um, there were testimony that inside the trunk of the dart, an umbrella was found, which had blood stains on it. Additionally, knife cuts were found on the armrest on the seat within the car. Upon subsequent police interrogations, the defendant confessed that he had stolen the car and that he had abducted Kathy. Um, Joe Harris had robbed her and stabbed her. He also gave police directions and drew a map to where her body could be located. 
It was also testimony by 13-year-old uh, Tenor French that on the morning of April 19, 1976, she had seen the defendant pursuant to a motion in, in, in line. She was not permitted to testify further. Pursuant to a motion. That's interesting. I would, okay. The mother and stepfather of the victim testified that around 5 p.m. on April 19th, their daughter was sent to the grocery store where she was to purchase hamburger, onion, green pepper, and cigarettes. You know, this is back in the day when going and sending your, your your little one to the grocery store. Just something you wouldn't think about twice, right? They described her as wearing a white football jersey with the number 68 on it, blue jeans and blue sandals. Since it had been raining, she took an umbrella with her, which the state, um, which they stated was identical to the one found in the trunk of the dart. Further evidence showed that the victim had gone shopping at the grocery store after which she was seen carrying a sack of groceries. Charles Grell, an employee at the store, stated that between 5.20 and 5.25 p.m., he last saw the Dodge Dart in question parked behind the store with his engine running. He had seen the car parked there every, um, every time he had stepped out of the store since 5 p.m., all of which totaled about five or six times. Lawrence Jensen testified that shortly after 5.15 p.m., he observed the victim and a man walking in an alley besides his home. Carol Ann Bohr testified that um, around the same time uh, she saw the victim and a man walking up and down behind the alley, apparently looking for something. She stated that Kathy Jo Harris was carrying an umbrella identical to the one found in the dart. It then described a brown car with yellow license plate. Subsequently, from memory, she wrote down the license number. Wow, that's a great memory. Um, I don't even know my own license plate number. <laughs> you know, I just my, my brain doesn't work that way. She stated that she had observed the two for around four minutes over an overcast daylight conditions. She then identified the defendant as the man she had seen with Harris that day. And this is the, the this guy hitchhiked with the Michael. Remember when, when hitchhiking was a thing? I actually, when I grew up, I would hitchhike. So um, I know it's not really, it's not a thing anymore, but I did it. Now, he was hitchhiking in Mount Vernon, south of Newton, on the evening of April 19, 1976, at which time he had picked up by the defendant inside the car in the back seat, observed a sack of groceries, which included an onion and packaged hamburger. He stated that the defendant drove him all the way to Naples, Florida. Illinois State Trooper Donald Ziegler testified on April 28, 1976, after following the search instructions given to me, he found the body of the deceased in the field. Um, so he took the map and it took him to her body. The evidence further showed, and here he is claiming he doesn't remember a thing, but he can draw a map. The evidence further showed that the genes on the deceased were unzipped and the breasts were ex was exposed. Two photographic slides were shown depicting the body at the location it was discovered. A third photographic slide was shown of the body after it had been prepared for autopsy. This showed the upper torso of the body and stab wounds. A pathologist testified that the victim had died as a result of five stab wounds. And remember, he he claims she picked up the knife and he panicked. And if only there wasn't a knife there. I mean, that's like, like it's a deviant brain. It, it's it's not a normal. He's not normal. He's, there's something wrong with him. And again, the only complaint I have about this parole hearing, this specific parole hearing, is that they actually granted him the right to have a parole hearing in three years. This man clearly needs to be locked up for the rest of his life. Um, like, there's no fixing him. So I, I just don't know why they do that. You can't explain that to me. A path only one voted against that. A pathologist testified that the victim had died as a result of five stab wounds to the chest made with sharp instrument. Vaginal examination showed the presence of sperm. Blood analysis showed the victim's blood type. It matched shoes. So everything matched. They all go here. This is all here. Uh, we've been here for a while now. I'll, um, I'm going to put these links in the description. We're going to watch the next hearing. We're going to see the inmate in person, a little bit better camera angle situation. We'll unpack it at the end. To me, this is absolutely fascinating. The contrast couldn't be more significant. And just keep in mind, as this happens, that he needs to get a minimum of eight um, of the 12 to vote for him in his favor. If he gets four to say no, he will get denied. With that, let's jump in. 
Um, on March 19th, 2024, Bernard McKinley was interviewed by myself via WebEx from Crossroads Adult Transition Center, where he's currently serving a sentence for murder with intent. He's been in custody for 23 years since 2001 when he was 16 years old and has a current MSR date of March 20th, 2026. Also present were four individuals speaking on his behalf, Carl Leonard of the Exoneration Project, um, who did note that he there is no innocence claim here. He simply represented Mr. McKinley um, in his resentencing hearings under Miller, um, as well as Jennifer Lackey and Sheila Betty of Northwestern University, Mr. Andre Martin, who serves as the program director at Crossroads, and Alyssa Martin, who is Mr. McKinley's um, aunt. Um, he appeared in a dress shirt and tie and presented with an amiable, reflective, and professional demeanor. Statement of facts of his case. On June 24th, 2001, Mr. McKinley, at the age of 16, shot and killed 23-year-old Abdo Serna Ibarra. The victim and his friends were on their way to play soccer when confronted by Mr. McKinley and his friends. Words were exchanged between the two groups, and a physical altercation took place between the victim and one of Mr. McKinley's friends. The victim's friends testified that they had then heard Mr. McKinley's friend, who had just been punched, yell, shoot him, shoot him. And Mr. McKinley then either drew a gun from his waistband, which is what's described in the statement of facts, or was handed a gun, which is what was referenced in appellate court hearings, um, and chased the victim and shot him once in the back and another several times after the victim turned around and raised his hands. His original sentence was 50 years for the murder, with a consecutive 50-year term for the firearm enhancement, for a total sentence of 100 years to be served at 100%. His co-defendant pled guilty to second-degree murder and was sentenced to 17 and a half years in prison. Mr. McKinley's sentence was initially affirmed through several post-conviction proceedings until the consideration of Miller v. Alabama, which found that the initial sentencing judge had failed to appropriately consider his age and maturity at the time of the offense. He was initially resentenced to 39 years. A further appeal found that the resentencing had also failed to appropriately consider his youth at the time of the offense and his subsequent rehabilitation, and he was resentenced once again to 25 years. And regarding his statement to the offense, at the interview, Mr. McKinley repeatedly took accountability for the offense and resultant harm, including to the victim, victim's family, his own family, and the broader community. He would return to these themes of harm and responsibility even when other topics were under discussion. He was able to articulate the ripple effects of taking an innocent life and the steps that he has taken since that time to reflect and grow from it. Among other efforts, he participated in the Healing Beyond Harm program, which provided an extensive restorative justice curriculum that culminated in his writing an apology letter to be available in an apology bank should the victim, victim's family ever choose to access it. Regarding his criminal history, he was a minor at the time of the offense. Before his arrest for this murder, he had only minor interactions with the police, and there are no subsequent violations of law on his record. Regarding his institutional adjustment, um, uh, from his childhood, uh, there is indication that he had a difficult childhood in which he was exposed to violence, experienced rejection by his father, and was left by his mom to be raised by his grandmother at a young age, um, and that uh, by all accounts he went on to pursue acceptance in the wrong crowds. Um, currently, he has no noteworthy mental or physical health diagnoses for our, our consideration. Um, in his 20 years in custody, he's had four tickets, none of which were for violence. His last ticket was in January of 2008. In his interview, he repeatedly took responsibility for his tickets and refused to minimize their significance despite their nonviolent nature. Um, I did note in viewing his master file that he had served an ex extensive period of time in administrative segregation at Menard from approximately 2012 to 2015. His master file contained minimal information, um, but made reference to an allegation that he had been using influence within the institution to encourage staff assaults. But it should be noted this allegation never went through the disciplinary process, nor is it reflected in his disciplinary record. Um, due to subsequent litigation, we were unable to discuss in much depth, but Mr. McKinley believed that the segregation was due to an intercepted communication with other individuals in custody that made reference to staff assaults. While he acknowledged and took responsibility for the reference, he indicated that it was in the context of ad advocating for the use of the legal system rather than violence to secure institutional change. Um, I did reach out to Internal Affairs to see if they had, could shed any further light on this period. Um, they indicated as context that it had been a very active time um, within IDOC from, uh, for the Latin folks and coordinating staff assaults and other resistance, and it resulted in a, sig a significant number of transfers and the removal of Latin folks and their affiliates from the general population. 
and his segregation had been part of that larger activity due to his association with the Spanish Cobras. Um, they did not communicate any current concerns about Mr. McKinley uh, within the institution. Um, he describes using his time in segregation to read vora uh, voraciously. He takes responsibility for the language of the communication that resulted in administrative segregation and now believes he was naive to believe that he could change the mindset of others about how to best redress grievances. He states that he knew when he was let out of segregation that he would rather stay in a corner to himself than be a part of anything that wouldn't have good results. Um, Mr. McKinley did earn his GED while he was still in Cook County subsequent to his arrest. He earned a paralegal degree in Menard where he has spent most of his time in custody. After his transfer to Stateville in 2016, his academic accomplishments include an associates in general studies from Oakton Community College and a bachelor in general studies from Northwestern last year. Um, his attorney in resentencing proceedings had indicated during our interview that Mr. McKinley had been kept on longer than typical as a porter due to the staff's reliance on him at Stateville. Um, at the time of his resentencing, Mr. McKinley had at least 15 people write letters of support, primarily professors who described him as conscientious, polite, inquisitive, reflective, thoughtful, diligent, humble, and a natural leader. He is currently deemed minimum security with no escape risk and was recently transferred to Crossroads Adult Transition Center in acknowledgement of his exceptional adjustment and achievements within IDOC. Notably, he is uh, believed to be the first individual in IDOC history to take the LSAT exam, resulting in his admission to two law schools this coming fall. IDOC employees have taken note of his efforts. Mr. Andre Martin, the program director at Crossroads, stated that Mr. McKinley has clearly, had clearly done the deep work of personal development prior to arriving at the ATC, and he's since gone above and beyond with all regulations, including in respect to his uh, approved community movement. In Mr. McKinley's offender overview, uh, the correctional counselor gave uh, the most glowing recommendation I've ever seen in one of those interviews, explicitly recommending that he be considered for parole and any other honorary opportunity available to him. He currently utilizes his work release for an intern position at Northwestern Law, where he works five days a week. Um, two days, he works, serves as a paralegal for uh, Professor Sheila Betty. Two days a week, he does research for Dr. Lackey at the Evanston campus. And on Fridays, he's involved with restorative justice initiatives. Dr. Lackey gave a statement that he is one of the most extraordinary people that she's met. Professor Betty stated that there was nobody to which she would give a higher recommendation and indicated that he's taken the lead on a lot of restorative justice work, including in shaping a supportive community around other formerly incarcerated individuals who are completing their schooling um, at Northwestern. Regarding his parole plans, Mr. McKinley plans to reside with his aunt in Maywood if released. His aunt, Alyssa Martin, was present at the hearing and affirmed her enthusiasm in hosting him. Um, as stated, he's also received the acceptance to two law schools this coming fall, DePaul and Northwestern. Um, and he indicated that he has some savings that he can draw from for basic needs. And his plan is to serve as a part-time paralegal while pursuing his law degree. He has an extensive support system in his family, the Northwestern community, and others. When asked what he would tell any board members uh, that may have a concern about public safety with his release, he stated that his actions speak louder than words, and IDOC has already entrusted him with community access within certain constraints, which he has treated with all due deference. He emphasized that the very source of his drive is to contribute to the public interest. He knows that he can't take away the harm that he already caused, but he can find ways to give back. Once he secures his law degree, he aspires to start a nonprofit legal clinic that tailors to those with mental health needs, although he was cautious to express too much about future plans as he understands that it's easier to make promises uh, than to actually put in the work and the real work will be in the action. Um, he's already utilized his moments of freedom to make positive contributions through multiple venues, including his involvement in Northwestern and a local restorative justice court. And he's currently trying to create a program to connect others within the ATC with a community courthouse nearby. Um, because he already has community movement at the ATC and does have an MSR date coming up in less than two years, I had asked what uh, an immediate parole would mean to him. Uh, while he emphasized his dedication to succeed under any circumstances, he described restric restrictions at the ATC that would limit his full access to resources and communication while pursuing his law degree and potentially impede his full engagement in the program. Uh, for example, there are movement restrictions that may limit his ability to engage in study groups and other campus activities and access to the university library. And the ATC uh, has only limited access to computers and he has to check his cell phone at the door. 
Um, regarding opposition to release, um, there was no documented opposition specific to his parole release. I will acknowledge that at his initial resentencing hearing, the state had advocated for a sentence that was substantially above the minimum, presenting a letter from the victims uh, who spoke to the hardships of losing the only relative that she had here in the United States, of having to break the news of the victim's death to his mom in Mexico and having to make arrangements for the victim's body to be returned to Mexico. The judge who initially resentenced Mr. McKinley to 39 years pointed to the mercilessness and senselessness of firing multiple shots at an individual who had his hand raised. Um, this is Mr. McKinley's first appearance in front of the board. If not granted release, uh, he would not be eligible until after his MSR date of 2026, so he would expire out at that time. Um, I don't have anything in particular to discuss during closed session unless anybody wanted details regarding those minor police interactions as a juvenile. Um, but otherwise, I would not move. I would I cede to the individuals present to speak. Thank you. Uh, do any of the board members have any questions for Ms. Flo Volker? Oh, hearing none, I guess we'll proceed on to council. Is it working? There we go. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Globacar and Mr. Chairman and members of the board. I'm Carl Leonard. I'm a staff attorney at the Exoneration Project, and I teach in a clinic at the University of Chicago Law School. It is, as all lawyers say, my honor to represent my client, but I really mean it. It is an honor to represent Bernard. I've represented him for a number of years. As Dr. Globacar said, I work in the Exoneration Project. Normally, we represent innocent people. But I, I want to, again, just reiterate that Bernard McKinley is not innocent. And he shot and killed a man named Abdo Serna Ibarra in June 2001 when Bernard was 16 years old. He's 39 now. You'll hear from him, but he has accepted responsibility for that time and time again. At the sentencing hearing where I represented him, he accepted responsibility. He's participated in the program that Dr. Globacar mentioned, where he wrote a letter to the family. He's my understanding is he will accept responsibility again before this board. Um, the I don't want to go back over everything Dr. Globacar already mentioned, but I, I do just want to emphasize that this is a situation where we don't have to reinvent the wheel. There was a whole sentencing hearing. There was an appeal. Dr. Globacar already interviewed Bernard and, and heard from all the witnesses. So there's a lot of relevant information that's already in the record that's already before this board. You heard about how Bernard was originally sentenced to 100 years in prison. He'd have been 116 when he got out. Miller versus Alabama came down. A federal court said his sentence violated the Eighth Amendment. We then represented him, and his sentence came down to 25 years, ultimately. And as Dr. Globacar mentioned, what we're ultimately asking for is for this board to shorten his MSR period by two years, which would allow him to attend Northwestern Law School in the fall. And he has accepted Northwestern's offer of admission, and he intends to go to Northwestern in the fall. Ultimately, I when this, the legislature passed the youthful parole bill, I don't know if they had any specific in mind. It wasn't somebody like Bernard McKinley, and I don't know who they had in mind. This is someone who attended Northwestern's prison education project program when he was at Stateville. Professor Lackey couldn't be here today because she's overseas for work, but we have a letter from her and she spoke at the institutional hearing. She runs that program and she explained how rigorous the admissions process is, how competitive it is, and how the students in that program are graded on the exact same scale as the students on the Evanston campus would be. They don't get any sort of special treatment or leniency. They go through the same program on the same metrics. The only difference is they're locked up and they're taking their tests with a pen, pencil and paper at Stateville instead of at Evanston. And he passed all his classes with flying colors. He earned a bachelor's degree from Northwestern while he was incarcerated. And as you heard, he's the first person in Illinois history to take the LSAT while incarcerated. Sheila Betty, a professor at Northwestern, um, she also spoke at the institutional hearing and talked about how she's not involved in the admissions process directly, but she's a professor at Northwestern. 
how they received over 6,000 applicants this year. And Bernard, again, on the same scale as any other applicant, was admitted to Northwestern and intends to go there in the fall. Um, what Sheila Betty, Professor Betty asked me to say was that Bernard truly exemplifies the power of human potential. And she wanted to emphasize the constraints that would be placed upon him if he were to attempt law school while in custody, even at crossroads. And I also, as I mentioned, teach at a law school. And while Bernard may have maybe allowed movement to go to class, the bulk of the learning that I think we do in law school happens outside of the classroom and is in your study groups, is in the library when you're doing research, is at home on your laptop computer, which he's not allowed to have at crossroads. So he would still go to Northwestern in the fall, and I think he would still do well, but he would be greatly inhibited in his ability to really engage in the program, really engage in what's been offered to him, the opportunity that he's earned if he were doing it while still in custody, even at crossroads. Annalise Booth is here. She's also a clinical professor at Northwestern to support Bernard. We have a letter from her where she talks about his accomplishments and what he um, would do, she anticipates, while in prison. Dr. Globacar talked about some of the evidence that was presented at the sentencing hearing in terms of his, um, his, his criminal, his history within IDOC. We actually had two correctional officers testify at that sentencing hearing, which is really unusual that current correctional officers would testify at a sentencing hearing on behalf of an incarcerated individual. We had one correctional officer who says he's, who testified that he's worked at Stateville for 24 years, interacted with Bernard daily, and described him as always compliant, always cooperative. Another correctional officer, a sergeant at Stateville, testified how he's been there for 20 years and that Bernard was always quiet, walked away from any confrontations, never had any disciplinary issues, and that he, Bernard was working as, as what's called a porter, who, which is a job that you only get if you have good behavior. Typically, it's a job you hold for 60 to 90 days, the sergeant testified. But because Bernard was so good at it, so easy to work with, he ensured that Bernard kept that job for, at that time, it was 18 months. Andre Martin is here. He has worked in, uh, with the IDOC and with the Safer Foundation and now at Crossroads for 25 years. He talked about how, how well Bernard has done in the program, how he's not only met every benchmark that they set, but exceeded them every single time. And we asked him at that hearing, because one of the things this board considers is what impact would granting this person parole have on institutional um, discipline and what happens inside the facility. And he said it would not have any negative effect. In fact, it would be um, an example for other people in the facility to strive towards and that he thinks overall it would improve any behavior issues that they have at Crossroads. I do want to talk a little bit about um, what Dr. Globacar mentioned where he was placed in administrative detention when he was at Menard. And he was in administrative detention for almost four years. He, at, as you heard, this was at a, at a point in time where the institutions were very concerned about issues involving um, staff assaults and focused on um, what they called the Latin folks gangs. Um, and there was, uh, they interviewed Mr. McKinley and asked him questions, who's running these gangs? He said, I don't know. They put him in segregation for 30 days. They said, do you know now? He still didn't know. They put him in segregation for 90 days. Do you know now? He still didn't know. So they placed him in administrative detention. He's never written any tickets. He's never receives any discipline. He's left there for almost four years, at which point Bernard, who's a better lawyer than me, sues the IDOC. Um, and the, it goes up to the Seventh Circuit, which agrees with Bernard and says, this appears to violate his civil rights, sends it back to the trial court, at which point this IDOC settles with Mr. McKinley. He's no longer in administrative detention, and he actually receives a financial settlement from IDOC, which was the terms of that are confidential. But he's never disciplined for anything that, that happened here. He consistently said, I don't know who is in charge of these gangs. He's never actually given a ticket or accused of any sort of actual misconduct there. Um, so that's sort of the explanation of that administrative detention issue. Alyssa Martin is here, no relation to Andre Martin. She is one of uh, 
Bernard's aunts. Also here is his mother. Ms. Martin owns a home in Maywood. She has a bedroom that would be just for Bernard. He can stay there, he can study there. And in addition to all the support that he has from his family, um, I wanna emphasize that we at the Exoneration Project stand behind Bernard. We employ a full-time client resources coordinator who can help with any issues that the family can't help with from getting insurance to getting a copy of his birth certificate if that's been misplaced to getting a bus pass, whatever he needs. So those issues will we will make sure are covered for him. So just stepping back and looking at Bernard, who he is, at everything he's accomplished, the appellate court, when it ordered Bernard's sentence reduced to 25 years, said that the evidence of his rehabilitation was overwhelming. That was the word they used. And I wanna emphasize that the vast majority of what Bernard accomplished was before Miller versus Alabama existed and well before the Youthful Parole Act existed. This was not, steps that he was taking in order to impress you all or in order to impress a sentencing judge who is considering the Miller versus Alabama factors because none of that existed. He took all of these steps towards rehabilitation because that's who he is. And I think that's really worth noting that this is an, an expression of his character of who he is, not an expression of some sort of attempt to garner favor from this body. I also want to acknowledge that I think all of us are aware of current events. And I think the oftentimes the IDOC is criticized, sometimes fairly, sometimes unfairly, for not adequately helping people rehabilitate. Bernard is a success story for the IDOC. He went in as a 16-year-old gang member and came out as somebody who has moved beyond all of that with a bachelor's degree from Northwestern and who had taken the LSAT. He is a success story for the IDOC. And as I mentioned with current events, I think there has been obviously some questions about this board. Bernard will be a success story for this board as well. If he is given the opportunity to be released on parole, go to Northwestern, he will succeed. He will do very well. He has the support of his family, of Northwestern, of us at the Exoneration Project. And he will be a success story for the Youthful Parole Act and for the actions of this board. So I strongly encourage that he be granted parole. I'm happy to answer any questions, but thank you very much. Thank you, Counselor. Uh, we'd like to hear from your client next, and then uh, we'll open it up for questions from the board. Uh, first, I want to say um, thank you for allowing me to attend and be in person. Um, I definitely take accountability for my acts. You know, I'm not going to sit here and try to mitigate it or try to justify it. I was 16, I did it, and you know, that's something I gotta live with. Uh, I was 19 when I was given a 100 year sentence and I was headed down state. And doing that six hour ride, you know, I had a lot of thinking to do and you know, I didn't know what my life was gonna be. All I knew is that it was a possibility I might not ever get out, but I was determined to do my best of basically finding myself and continuing to better myself, no matter what the outcome was. And this was in 2004. Uh, any person that comes into IDLC, an adult facility at a juvenile age or as a teenager, going to have challenges, you know, and I faced those challenges and I overcame those challenges. At the same time, I've stayed focused on bettering myself and what I want to do. Um, like my um, attorney said, I didn't start educating myself before, I mean, after Miller came out. I was a paralegal before Miller came out. Um, I had other certificates of self-help and other things that allowed me to continue to go towards that positive transformation before Miller came out. Uh, this, this has been a hell of a journey and, you know, I'm proud to sit here and say that this fall I will be a JD candidate and soon be civil rights attorney. Uh, it's no shortcoming, and I'm going to always be in debt for my actions and what I did, but my worst mistake ain't who I am right now, and 
my actions is showing that. You know, this is just the foundational work that I'm doing. Once I get my law degree and I'm able to start practicing, then y'all really gonna see exactly what my work can do. And like I say, I'm not here to minimize what I did. You know, I'm 100% guilty and I'm taking full accountability of it. And you know, I'm just hoping that one day when I do get out that I'm able to contribute back into my own community and help those, especially the average youth because they need role models like me to be able to show them that you can make mistakes, but you can transform and better yourself if you're determined to and given the right opportunity. So I ask y'all to please allow me to be able to, to attend law school the way every law student can and allow me to continue to show positive transformation and, and do what I can do to get back to my community. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll open it up now from the board if anybody has any questions. I have a couple of questions. Uh, it, the appellate opinion, which I think is attached as exhibit one to your petition, uh, the court wrote that at the resentencing hearing, the defense counsel asked for a 25 year sentence. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And uh, I'm curious, in light of the request for parole now in advance of the 25 years, what the thinking was in requesting 25 years? The sentencing range for first degree murder is 20 to 60. And so I think it's always a difficult decision on the defense side of whether you're gonna ask for a number or whether you're going to say something at the lower end. I think sometimes, I'm, I'm, I'm using vague terms because I don't wanna get too far into attorney work prep, but sometimes it makes sense to use, to pick a specific number that accounts for the severity of the crime and the particular characteristics of the individual defendant. And in those circumstances, we would sort of try to pick a number that we thought accounted for the severity of the crime and any sort of mitigating factors. And so um, ultimately, the trial judge rejected the suggestion that we made for a number, but then the appellate court accepted the suggestion that we made. Thank you. Mr. Heaton, any other questions? No. All right, Ms. Goff. Thank you. Um, this is for Bernard. First of all, uh, thank you for coming today and, and presenting your thank you. congratulations on the work that you have done. You um, mentioned that you're a restorative justice practitioner, so that leads me to ask you those questions. And, and I think you know what questions we generally ask when we sit in a conference and ask the question of, so who was harmed with your offense? I would say everybody. And I would say not only the victim, the victim family, my family, the community. And it took a while for me to accept that I also had to put myself in that category because I didn't feel like I deserved to be in that category. I saw that um, through your file and of course through your education that you're building your capacity to make better decisions and choices than you did prior to that. Um, in, in looking at pursuing your law degree, I, I sort of heard what, what drove you, what made you want to do that and what you would like to do with that degree when you're done. That would be related to your competency Can you repeat that one more time? Sure. Did, what is it that's driving you that makes you want to be an attorney? What is it that you hope to practice and do? What is the change you want to see in the world? First, um, I'm heavily involved with my passion and public interest. So my goal, once I get my law degree, is to first create a nonprofit legal clinic within my community that allows me to educate my community on the laws of their civil rights but to also be able to have resources there that's able to cater to mental health needs. Okay, so is that how you see yourself repairing the harm that you caused? I see that as part of the way I could help or repair the harm, but it's gonna be a continuous work, but
for the rest of my life. That's the honest. So. Thank you. All right, Senator Delgado. William Delgado, thank William. you. <laughs> I've been retired a while. Um, first of all, good morning uh, to you. Um, uh, Bernard, thank you. are you from the Belmont Cragen area? I see this happen at Pulaski. I, I, I know the park. I happen in my community. No, I'm not. Okay, and so prior to that, on that day, you traveled over there? Oh, at that time, yeah. I was yeah, I was staying with my aunt there. So you at were that time, in the, yeah, in the yeah. community there at the park, but I, it's very active there. Um, and at the end of the day, when you go, when you leave, what, if you were to be released now, where would you be going? May Maywood, Illinois. Okay, as it indicated in the petition. Going back to my my observation, um, when that occurred, the young man, uh, in your mind, belonged to what street gang? Say it one more time. In your mind, what street gang did the the, the victim belong to? Because I see this, a, you know, this is don't blame, this is blaming um, the victim. We have two, two Latin, situations here. The Latin Kings. The Brother Kings. And in that time, um, and that occurred in the Belmont Cragen community, is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, uh, your evolution is phenomenal. When you were at that age, where were you going to school? Steinmetz High School. That's Steinmetz, okay? And uh, you have no other criminal history, if you will. Uh, that's correct, is that right? Yes, sir. And um, Northwestern isn't somewhere that's easy to get into, so. No, it's not easy at all. And, um, but at the end of the day, um, so this was a, a gang, two gang affiliations that, that occurred that day, and, and it, that occurs, unfortunately, in our communities. Um, your evolution is, is, is one uh, very unique. Um, I commend you for that. Um, that area has healed quite a bit. Um, and I would just be asking if I didn't see anything in my records here, um, is there anyone in opposition in terms of family that may be here? I don't see any uh, notes in my file. Uh, I would ask that of the chair. Uh, Bernard, I wanna thank you and, and your able counsel um, as to how how far you've how much you've grown, how that emphasis has been there, um, the achievements speak for themselves. Um, at the end of the day, um, it saddens me for a community member though that 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 we have to go in to get all that done, and when when it should be done in our in our lifestyles. Uh, but you've done a phenomenal job, and I want to leave that there. Okay. Other than that, Mr. Chairman, no other questions other than an inquiry. I don't believe anybody's registered to protest, but do I have any other questions from any of the other board members at this time? Uh, Ms. Coronas? Good morning again, and thank you for the information shared. Um, you know, community, as you indicated, and as well as yourself, uh, are harmed from an action you took that was pretty serious, right? And it's gang related. Um, how do you feel that this is not going to create further harm from retaliation. I have to ask the question, even though it's been years, part of the system, I'll call it within the gang structure, mm -hmm. is you know getting back to each other in mm -hmm. any way possible. And that creates further harm for community. Your actions have demonstrated that you're pulling away from that, not making it a situation for retaliation. But at the same time, the work that you're gonna pursue is gonna put you in those areas, right? You're gonna be speaking to youth who still have that mindset of getting back at people in whatever fashion or way, because that's the lifestyle and continues to be, and this is why we continue to have shootings in our community, not understanding, not to be reactive, not to make poor choices. How do you see that? Have you thought about that as you venture into um, larger communities and then you're gonna refocus into communities who are um, suffering? Can you share a little bit about that? I know it's uh -huh. a question, but it's a statement. At the uh -huh. same time, what are your thoughts around putting community at harm concerning what you're doing and if there is some thought around someone retaliating? Um, I've been out since December last year, 
far as movement inside the community. Every day I take public transportation. Yeah, I understand um, your concern as far as that question, but I can't allow that to stop me from doing what I need to do to my, help my community. So the choices I made at that age have been made already, but I can't live in fear. You know, I can't live in fear of somebody wanting to retaliate against me today, tomorrow, 10 years from now. Because at the end of the day, I have a job to do, I have a responsibility to do, and it's to give back to my community. So if that means sacrificing my life in order to give back to my community for the harm I did, then that's the, the job and the duty I'm taking. So at the end of the day, I'm gonna have that legal clinic and I'm gonna give back to my community in every way I can, and I'm gonna let my community know that I'm there for them. Thank you for saying that, um, and I appreciate that uh, sharing um, position you're taking because we cannot break from fear, right? Um, I also just want to highlight the fact that he has started the um, the healing process, hopefully through the, and I say hopefully for community to, to get access mm -hmm. through the bank that you submitted your letter, mm -hmm. correct? You submitted yes. a letter uh, to the victim, and if when they want to access it, they can, right? Exactly. Um, this is, I don't know if the board's familiar with that process. Um, I don't want it explained in length, but it's an opportunity for our returning citizens to write a letter of apology um, to the victim or to victims in similar situations to access that letter. And that's afforded to uh, only, I believe, certain institutions, I don't know if they've expanded, uh, but that gives the opportunity for returning citizens to express if the victim is unable. And of course, we can't connect victim to returning citizen at this time. So I commend you for taking that opportunity and doing that as, since you. it was extended to you, because that's a start in the right direction. And I commend you for everything else you're doing and that you took self initiative and partnered with IDOC and what they did afford in programming to you and you took advantage and went above and beyond. And thank you for your commitment to the community. We need folks like you out there to redirect youth and families. Families are critical to the transformational change. And I appreciate seeing your mom back there to continue to support you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Taronis. Um, Does any of the other board members have any questions? Mr. Coates? Just one quick thing. Uh, I won't belabor what's already been said, but Ms. McKinley, Ms. McKinley I just wanted to commend you for your minimal uh, disciplinary ticket history uh, since you've been incarcerated. Um, I think that's that's noteworthy. And uh, I want to commend you for your pursuit of your education. And I think that, you know, rehabilitation is, is really important. I do believe you are a success story. I um, mean, and, and your evolution is remarkable. And so I uh, just congratulations on that. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions from any other board member? All right, Mr. Delgado. Oh yeah, Mr. Chair, you mentioned that he had family here. Did you want to rise so we could see who you are? <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I have one question. Um, the uh, the court reduced the sentence from 100 down to 25, and that was done on February 25th of 21, less than about three years ago, a little over three years ago. Uh, and at 25, when that sentence was reduced down to 25, all the evidence that you presented today, it was presented uh, for that hearing. And you said that the court uh, felt that uh, evidence of rehabilitation was overwhelming, but felt that a 25 year sentence was appropriate at that point three years ago. What's changed since uh, 21? Uh, you were asking for another reduction on top of the reduction from down to 25. Um, at the time that the court had reduced my time to 25 years, I had not obtained my bachelor's degree from Northwestern. They knew that it was a prospect that I would uh, eventually uh, um, receive it, 
but they did not know that I was the first person in Illinois history to take the LSAT, and they did not know my plans to go to law school, to be actually admitted into law school, not hoping to go to law school, and what I'm gonna do after law school. Those facts happened after my resentencing within the last three years. You can still go to law school while you're on uh, parole at the a ATC Center, is that correct? I would be able to go to parole, but I will be heavily restricted in the form of being able to take the opportunities that every other law student have to make sure they're able to effectively uh, succeed in law school. I don't want to barely make it out of law school. I should be able to fully succeed and be able to take care and have all the resources at my disposal that's gonna allow me to be able to come in that classroom and be well prepared and not hope that I could barely make a C or anything of that nature to you know, get this degree. I, I want to graduate at the highest of my ability and being restricted at crossroads, not being able to have my laptop, not being able to have my phone, not being able to go to certain events, not being able to be able to speak to professors after class hours in order to get that advice or that mentorship that I might need because I'm struggling in the class probably don't understand the material as best as possible. Those are the opportunities that will be restricted from me if I'm stuck in at the um, ATC Center. Can I, Mr. Chairman, can I add one thing to the first part of your question about sure. what's changed? I think, actually I'm gonna add two things. I think some things have changed just factually. He's now graduated from Northwestern with a bachelor's degree. He took the LSAT and was admitted. But the main thing is I think a court, when it issues a sentence, is not, that doesn't co-opt the power of this board. It issues a sentence aware of what parole opportunities exist, whether it's regular MSR, whether it's youthful parole. And so it's not like the appellate court said he does 25 years and he should not get out on parole before the end of that 25 year sentence. They sentence someone aware of the existence of this board and other opportunities like that. So yes, the, sent the court did what's within its power and said, we think a 25 year sentence is appropriate. And I don't think that speaks to this board's power. And we're asking this board to exercise the power that the legislature gave to it to decide whether or not to issue a, a youthful parole. But the court had the option of going down to 20 years on a murder charge, because that's the minimum. So they had that option at the time of sentencing. Is that correct? And there, this goes to the, uh, the question for Mr. Heaton. Um, I have second guessed the decision not to ask for 20 years many, many times. But I think I ended up creating a floor by saying that we wanted a 25 year sentence. Okay, I have no further questions. Uh, see, any other questions from any other board member? Seeing none, Ms. Revoker, do you have any motion? Um, I do, I'll share my rationale as well. Um, the board is tasked with considering whether a person's release would deprecate the seriousness of the initial offense, whether it would be detrimental to institutional discipline, and whether the individual can reasonably be expected to conform to the conditions of release. Based on Mr. McKinley's own testimony, as well as that of others and many letters of support, he has demonstrated positive character and accomplishments during his time in study. He's described as having uh, demonstrated impeccable compliance in his community movement from the ATC. Um, as we've heard, there are correctional officers that have actually testified during the resentencing on his behalf. It does appear in full evidence that Mr. McKinley would conform to the conditions of release. Andre Martin, the program director from Crossroads, specifically in our interview, shared that Mr. McKinley's parole would have a positive effect on institutional discipline by serving as an inspiration to others who have seen his efforts and successes, indicating that he has set the standard among his peers. Um, it appears that his release would likely have a positive effect on institutional discipline. This only leaves the question of whether his release would deprecate the seriousness of the underlying offense. Mr. McKinley committed a senseless act that took the life of Mr. Abdo Serna Ibarra and forever impacted the lives of his loved ones. At, at Mr. McKinley's resentencing, this harm was weighed against his youthfulness at the time of the offense and his actions since incarceration, resulting in his current 25 year term. While it's difficult to imagine any sentence that would reflect the depth of harm caused by a murder, 
as, and as Mr. McKinley himself acknowledges, nothing can take away that harm. He has demonstrated his commitment to making amends to the best of his ability. In this unique case, ongoing incarceration would, to some extent, impede those efforts. As he is near the end of his current sentence and appears to appropriately carry the weight of Mr. Sierna Ibarra's death with him in his reparative endeavors, in this particular case, I don't believe it would deprecate the seriousness of the offense. It's thus with all due acknowledgement of the irreparable suffering of the victim's family, that based on my assessment of the three factors to be considered in parole decisions, my motion is to grant parole to Mr. To Mr. McKinley. We have a second? I'll second. Second. Okay. Motion's been made and seconded. Clerk, you may call the roll. Ms. Glaboker? Mr. Boland? No. Mr. Coates? Yes. Mr. Delgado? Yes. Ms. Gall? Yes. Mr. Grubbs? No. Mr. Heaton? Yes. Ms. Schaffner? Before I render my vote, I would want to commend counsel for the recommendation for 25 years um, because it gives this board the opportunity to acknowledge and um, uh, provide some acknowledgement for his success. Uh, in this vote, and so my my vote is uh, yes. Ms. Taronis? Yes. Ms. Tyson? Yes. Mr. Toothy? No. It's eight to three, they passed. Motion passed eight to three. Congratulations. Thank you very much. I don't know about you, but I just love this story. I, gosh, I mean, so there's a lot of information uh, that Richard shared. I, there's like, I have like 50 tabs open. I'm not going to share all of that with you. I'll, I'll share a few of the news stories because he actually made the news just one month before this hearing. You know, I didn't realize this, but the school that he was accepted to has a four- percent acceptance rate and i mean the first person in doc history to take his lsat from prison pass and get accepted to law school and they said there were no they didn't give it to him because he's in prison or there were no exceptions there were no sp special grants he he did this on his own and it's just the story from from being a, a gang member to going through prison and doing this, it's unbelievable. The first in history. And what surprised me the most about all of this is that the Illinois Board of Paroles three denied him. He, if he had one more denial, he would have, he would have been denied. Now, his sentence was first 100 years, then they they dropped it down, then they dropped it down a little bit more. And then I, I can't actually think of any legitimate reason for denying him. You know, the, the one that comes up is, well, the Supreme Court said that it should be reduced to 25 years and we don't want to overrule the Supreme Court. But his attorney set the floor at 25 years he explained that process so in my opinion that even that just throws that excuse if you're like you know the person who wants to worship the supreme court i, I i'm just shocked you know i just the, the perception of illinois to me and, and the way that i viewed it is not the <laughs> illinois that i just thought i saw three denials i i, I it's remarkable to me and i don't understand it you can't to me, that doesn't make any sense. This should have been a unanimous uh, vote. So I am very eager to see more Illinois hearings. We have one more hearing, um, which the board would, would did not take it easy on him. I mean, in, in some sense, it's like maybe they're just it, – it's just it, – I don't know. I don't know what to say. Um, but we'll, we'll go – we'll watch some of this stuff. We'll go over the court document a little bit of that about what actually happened, but I'm sold hook, line, and sinker on this man, on Bernard McKinley. I mean, I think that that they're going to, in my, they're probably going to have a Netflix 
uh, series on this guy. I mean, he, it, it, it's remarkable. It's remarkable. It's just absolutely incredible. And let's go check this out. All right, we're going to turn now to a story about second chances and a man turning his life around. In the fall, Bernard McKinley will join the class of 2027 at the Northwestern School of Law. Now, his journey to study there is like no other. ABC's Will Gans joins us now with his story. Good morning, Will. Good morning, Gio. The acceptance rate at Northwestern's law school is just 4%, but the odds of Bernard McKinley even being able to apply were so unlikely. Here's his story. Bernard McKinley will start law school in the fall, but his trajectory to this moment, almost impossible. McKinley earning his bachelor's degree, taking the LSAT and applying for law school all while incarcerated. He was sentenced to nearly 100 years behind bars after a gang-related conviction at age 19, making a decision to change his life on his bus ride to the state penitentiary. I promised myself before I got out that bus that no matter what the outcome was, that you know I was just going to try to do better for myself. So he did. While behind bars, McKinley earned his GED and applied to a paralegal program. I started trying to understand the law um, little by little. McKinley working to reduce his own sentence and sharing what he learned with those without the means or access to legal aid. I was giving back and contributing to those who was in need of help, you know, in spite of them being incarcerated with me. You know, they were still human beings. Jennifer Lackey had a front row seat to McKinley's perseverance. For the five years in the program, Bernard just worked tirelessly. He was relentlessly focused. Now looking forward to starting school in the fall. My goal is to be a civil rights attorney and to also open up a nonprofit legal clinic in the inner city of Chicago. And though McKinley is the first graduate of Northwestern's prison education program to go to law school, he hopes he won't be the last. Allow your incarceration to be a time of self-transformation. Not only was Bernard the first incarcerated person to take the LSAT in Illinois, he's also the first person in his family to go to college. A full circle moment for the man who says he accepts full responsibility for the mistakes he made at age 16 and for the man he's becoming 23 years later. What a wow. story. And the message, too allow the incarceration to be a transformation. Yeah. Um, and he's doing exactly that. And yeah. he worked so hard. Yeah. Great story, Will. Thank you, Thank Gio. You. you better. That is pretty incredible. I was thinking of that line he said to um, <clears throat> let your incarceration be your transformation. Hey, that's probably the best way to look at it if you're going to spend all this time locked up, but so few do. And Again, I'm just blown away that three uh, wanted to deny him. I, I, I can't wrap my mind around it. Now, um, okay, so so he's he he's out. I think he's gonna he's the real deal. I think he's gonna make changes in this uh, in his. It's it, it's cool. I feel I, I needed this story. I don't know about you guys, but I needed this. Um, and it, it's quite int interesting. Now, he, he he wasn't kidding when he when he started practicing law. Richard shared with me like 20. I mean, he was he was I mean, maybe there's a reason why they kind of retaliated against him with that gang stuff. Um, I'm just speculating here. You know, if you remember in the hearing how they actually, um, you know, got him in trouble and kind of was. So he has all these lawsuits. <laughs> he has lawsuits uh, filed against the DOC and against certain uh, COs and a kid. So he's got one after the other, after the other, after the other. So he was he might have pissed some people off in the system. And maybe that's actually why uh, they put him through all that trouble a few years ago with the whole gang thing when it clearly he wasn't associated with any gang. But again, that's just speculation. Um, but so let's go over this one real quick. And of course, thank you, Richard, for putting this all together. I mean, sometimes it's just too much information for me to digest um, that we have to share here. So I try to, especially after a long hearing, just keep it down to the to the uh, what, what I find particularly interesting. So this is written in 2018. Little hope of release for many juvenile with life sentences. And, and from reading this, by the way, again, it seems that Illinois... 
they were not all, you know, rainbows and butterflies about releasing their inmates. They were giving him a hard time, which just not thought something I would have expected. So, you know, we learned something new all the time. And I don't know. You know, it's not what I expect from the Illinois culture and court system, but they talk about the story. The order came from a 15-year-old bicycle near Chicago Park in 2001. Shoot him. Shoot him. This is, again, talking about the, the crime scene. Bernard McKinley, 16, obliged. And Abdo Surma Ibarra, 23, never made his way to the soccer field. McKinley was later arrested and charged as an adult uh, with first-degree homicide for the killing of Serna in 2004. Cook, uh, in 2004, Cook County jurors found him guilty. The sentencing judge, Kenneth J. Wattis, went on to make an example of McKinley and his homicide, condemning the young man to 100 years in Illinois Department of Corrections, 50 years for the murder, um, and a consecutive 50 years for the fatal use of a firearm. The sentence was necessary to deter other criminals, Wada said in court, and would enable another and would enable others to play soccer with the one less Bernard McKinley out there with a handgun blowing them away. Um, with no chance of parole or early release, McKinley was doomed to either live to celebrate and surpass his 116th birthday or grow old and die within the fortress of the state prison system. And look, the, 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 the life sentence for taking a life in that way, um, I, I don't disagree with, with that. Uh, we, I mean, we see that all the time, right? So it's not, that's not, you know, um, the sentencing judge, although, you know, they, they kept making it out to be like a game thing, uh, in the hearing and they don't mention that here. Of course it, it doesn't mean that it wasn't, it's just, so the sentencing judge, Kenneth J. Wattis, went on to make an ex okay, da, 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 with no chance of parole. Okay, I'm sorry, I went through that. A court reckoning. Over the past few decades, scientific research and courts began grappling with a question that could dra dramatically shift the course of McKinley's life. When it comes to crime, are children adults? Are children and adults different? Court across The courts across the country slowly began to address the issue bolstered by research showing that the human brain, particularly parts responsible for controlling impulses and assessing consequences, is not fully developed until one early 20s. And so courts ushered in a new era of decision make ruling again and again that children accused and convicted of crimes must be treated differently than adults. The decision culminated in a Miller versus Alabama, which of course this is what we see all the time in Louisiana. Um, a 2012 U.S. Supreme Court ruling that laws declared mandatory life without parole sentence for juveniles, even for those convicted of murder, are unconstitutional under the Eighth Amendment. The court found that the mandatory sentence pre uh, precluded judges from considering the defendant's chronological age and its hallmark features among them. Immaturity in... I know this word. It's different when you read it. Impetuosity. Um, and failure to appreciate risks and consequences. The court reasoned that the youngest offenders have diminished culpability and the greater prospects of reform and to require those mandatory sentences without considering features that the youth constitutes cruel and unusual punishment. But this is a nice little timeline here. So they have 2005, um, where they banned the death penalty for juveniles. 2010, Graham versus Florida, where they banned life without parole for juvenile offenders for um, convicted of non-homicidal crimes. Then you have Miller. Uh, this is a cool, this is a cool chart. Okay, McKinley uh, versus Butler, U.S. Court of Appeals, Seventh uh, Circuit, 2016. Uh, ruled in discretionary 100 year sentence was an unconstitutional de facto life sentence. Then you have the classic Montgomery versus Louisiana, U.S. Supreme Court 2016 applied Miller versus Alabama decision retroactively to prisoners currently serving mandatory life without parole. And we know that one, don't we? And then Illinois Supreme Court 
2016 ruled mandatory 97 year sentence for a juvenile offender was a de facto life sentence unconstitutional under Miller. We'll go briefly over this if you wanted more information on the crime. It's one of his appeals. Um, now, the appeal was interesting. It, well, he wasn't claiming innocence. It was a habeas corpus. So I think that makes a big difference. I guess he was just saying he was didn't have proper representation or maybe he gave a, a confession that shouldn't have been admissible. I'm not sure. But background on June 24, um, 2001, 23-year-old, so this is the victim, was gunned down on his way to play soccer. Now, this is interesting, again, because they, 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 they don't make it seem like a gang thing at all, but I'll just have to believe it that it was in this case, as it wasn't contested. Um, Sixteen-year-old Bernard McKinley, the petitioner and co-defendant were charged with the homicide. McKinley was convicted after a jury trial and sentenced to consecutive 50 years, one for murder, one for deadly use of firearm. McKinley appealed unsuccessfully and received no relief from Illinois court on his original and successive post-conviction petitions. He now petitions the court for a writ of habeas corpus, arguing that his conviction and sentence violate federal constitution. Trial. Victim was shot shortly after he and three friends, Hugo, Ociel, Espinoza, and Adrian Roman, or Roman, purchased a soccer ball and were walking to Coe's Park to play. On the um, to play. On the way to the store, they had a brief confrontation with a young black man. When they left the store, they were confronted by the same young black man they had seen earlier, this time accompanied by a group of young men, all of whom were Hispanic. One of them, Edward, ultimately McKinley's co-defendant, and Serna argued and got into a fist fight. After um, Edward fell off his bike, he pulled a gun from his waistband, handed it to his friend who is who who um, we just watched his parole hearing, and and yelled, "Shoot him! Shoot him!" Why? Can you imagine? It's like why did the guy? He didn't you know. He hands it to his sixteen-year-old buddy and says, "Shoot him! Shoot him!" Now that's when Serna turned and fled. Um, he was shot in the back once. Then the victim turned around and raised his hands. So this is brutal because he turned around, he raised his hands, and then he shot him point blank several more times. And then he ran away. And he was later, Bernard was later identified as the shooter. There was no physical evidence, such as a murder weapon presented against McKinley at trial. The bulk of the evidence consisted of the testimony and the investigating police officers, forensic witnesses. And, and, and here's my point. I... If anyone's going to get this parole, it's Bernard McKinley. So I just, uh, I don't know. I, I'm sure there are going to be those that say, no, you take a life. You, you, but I, I just, I have to adamantly disagree on, uh, on this case. Um, the bulk of evidence consisted of testimony, investigating police officers, forensic witnesses, and four witnesses who identified McKinley as the shooter, the three friends of the victim present during the shooting, the confrontation preceded it, and one resident in the neighborhood, Michael Thomas, who was familiar with McKinley and testified that he saw McKinley flee the scene with a revolver in his hand. The three friends testified that they had uh, picked McKinley out of a photo array and that Thomas picked from a lineup the day after the shooting, and each of them identified McKinley in the court shooter. In his trial testimony, when asked if he had ever given the detective a description of the shooter hairstyle, Adrian, uh, through a Spanish language interpreter, that the shooter's hair was longer than McKinley. At that time, we viewed the lineup in W89. Da, 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 da. Let's see if there's anything worth going over here. There's a lot in there, but I don't think it's worth going over. I just paused it and read through it. I, I think the you know again the purpose is he he takes a, he's not saying he's innocent, even though he has someone from the Innocence Project uh, representing him. And I do love that he has this attorney that's been helping him do this. Um, the whole point, the whole story here is going from one extent as a 16 year old 
kid gang member um, taking a life. And, you know, Richard has in the notes from punk to scholar. And I think that sums it up uh, pretty well. And I'm a broken record, but hey, the contrast from the first hearing to this hearing, it's two worlds apart. One man who should frankly die in prison and another man who really has just broken barriers and who can make a a real difference in this world. And that's a very special thing. Thank you, critics, for sharing this with us. Thank you, Richard, for recording it, doing all the research, putting it all together. And um, let me know in the comment section if you want to see more of these Illinois hearings. And with that, I'll let you go.